Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. This is Conservation in the Classroom, where you get to interact with one of WWF's very own experts. My name is Kate, and I am your host. And to kick things off today, I want to first introduce our featured presenter that we have joining us today. His name is Mike Osmond. He is a senior program officer with the Oceans team here at WWF. And today, Mike is actually here for a little pre-celebration of World Whale Day, which is coming up this weekend. Um, Mike has actually spent quite a few time throughout his career with whales. He's got some very up close and personal stories to share with us, as well as some really cool footage. And he's going to teach us all about one species in particular, which is, of course, the humpback. So, Mike, thanks for joining us today. If you want to just hop on and say hi to everyone, we're really happy to have you here. Thank you very much, Kate, and I'm happy to be here, too, and share some of my stories about humpback whales. So before I pass things officially over to Mike, I of course wanna take a minute to give a shout out to all of you that are joining us live today. So those of you that are watching from the webpage, be sure to use that Google form that you see under the video there to introduce yourself and place any questions that you have for Mike during his presentation. We will try to get as many of those questions answered at the end as we can. And we have a few very special guests joining us on camera today. I'm so excited to have them here. So first up from Bangor, Maine, and celebrating his birthday today, we have Tristan. Hi, Tristan. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here and learn all about humpback whales. Thanks for sharing your special day with us, Tristan. And next up, originally from South Africa, but now hailing from Danville, California, we have Isabel and Luke. Hi. Hello. We're really excited. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we have the crew here today. We've got all our WWF species representing here with Tristan and Isabel and Luke. So we're really glad to have you guys here. Mike, if you are ready, I will pass things over to you and you can take it from here if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Okay, Kate, let's try it and see if it works. How does that look? Okay. Looking good. Right. -o. Okay. So as Kate said, everyone, my name is Mike Osmond and I have been with World Wildlife Fund for 19 years. I'm originally from Australia and I grew up in a small country town, hundreds of miles from the ocean. But the only thing I ever wanted to do was be a marine biologist. So when I finished school, I went to a university in a place called Townsville. Up, on the, up in Queensland on the Great Barrier Reef. And I was lucky enough that when I finished my marine biology degree, they had just made the Great Barrier Reef a marine park. And I first got a job doing underwater surveys of the whole reef, and that job lasted a year. And then I eventually got a job as one of the first marine park rangers, which was when this picture was taken, long time ago. <laughs> I eventually moved to the other side of Australia and worked in marine parks there. So when I was working on the Great Barrier Reef, it was when I first came across humpback whales and that's how I got in my interest. And I worked with humpbacks in Western Australia as well. A few years later, I was offered a job to run a humpback whale research project where I would spend six months working with humpbacks in Maui. And when they would head off to Alaska, I would then go back to Australia and work on the humpback population that moved along the East Coast of Australia. I met my wife in Maui and we eventually moved to San Francisco and I was lucky enough to get a job with World Wildlife Fund, so here I am. But enough about me, let's, let's talk about whales. So there's two types of whales. There's toothed whales and baleen whales. Toothed whales include sperm whales, pilot whales, orcas, dolphins, and porpoises. The largest toothed whale is the sperm whale. They feed primarily on giant squid, which live deep in the ocean, and they use sound to stun the squid they can produce a sound equivalent to a jet engine and they can focus the sound to stun their prey. At the bottom of this picture of this slide is a skull of a toothed whale and you can clearly see why they are called toothed whales. 
The other group of whales, besides toothed whales, are baleen whales. Instead of teeth, they have baleen plates that filter food from the water. They are made of keratin, same material as your fingernails. These whales use the baleen plates to filter food on small organisms like krill or small fish, but they need to eat very large volumes of their prey. The largest baleen whale is the blue whale. Now they can grow up to 100 feet or more. They are the largest animal that's ever existed on this planet. They're much larger than any dinosaurs that, that ever came along. And they can hold over 90 tons of food and water in their mouth. For an interesting example of something of how big they are is that the, the one of the blood vessels that leads into their heart, their aorta, is large enough that a human can fit inside their blood vessel. Baleen whales also include the whale we're talking about today, which is the humpback. Humpbacks can grow to around the size of a large school bus. Females are generally larger than males. They can weigh up anywhere from 25 to 35 tons and may live up to about 80 years of age. In this picture of the inside of a humpback's mouth, you can see the pink portion, which is equivalent to the roof of our mouth. And on the side, you can see the baleen plates hanging down from the roof of its mouth. Humpbacks migrate along the coasts of all the world's continents. They spend winters in the tropics and summers in the cooler, cooler polar regions like snowbirds. They migrate around 16,000 miles each year. They feed at both the northern and southern polar regions, and they use a range of different feeding strategies, including lunge feeding and bubble netting. When they are bubble netting, the pod will dive underneath a school of krill or small fish and swim towards the surface, emitting a ring, ring of bubbles and a, an, a, an array of sounds as they move up towards the surface. They also use sound to help concentrate their prey inside the bubble net. And this is what it sounds like. So when they come to the surface, they open their mouths and take in large volumes of water and small fish. Their ventral pleats, which are the underside of their mouth, can expand and accommodate up to about a swimming pool's worth of water. They then close their mouths and squeeze the water out through the baleen and trap their food against the inside of the baleen. They then use their tongue, which is about the size of an elephant, to suck the food down their throat. Humpbacks only feed when they are in the colder, polar regions and they will go for around eight months with no food as they migrate to their tropical winter breeding and calving areas. So they lose a lot of weight during this time, relying on their stored blubber to provide them with enough energy to swim the 6,000 miles to the breeding grounds and back. All baleen whales have a double blowhole. Humpbacks have lungs that are around the size of a small car and they can empty and refill them in less than two seconds. This means the air comes out of their lungs with a lot of force and noise. So let's listen to what that sounds like. Each whale has a very distinctive blow and whale experts can tell a whale species from a long way away just by the sh shape and height of their blow. In humpbacks, the blows are around 10 to 12 feet high and they are a balloon shape. And in this picture, you can see an adult on the right-hand side, which is a mother and a, and a smaller whale, which is the calf on the left-hand side. This is a picture of a pregnant female. She got pregnant during the tropical breeding ground the year before went to the polar region to feed during the summer months and is now on her way back to the tropics to give birth. The gestation period for humpback whales is around 11 and a half months. And when the calves are born, they're around 10 to 12 feet long and weigh about a ton. Calves are born in tropical waters because when they are born, they don't have a very well developed blubber layer 
And if they were born in polar waters, they would not survive the freezing temperatures. When they're in the tropics, the mothers feed the calves a diet of milk and the calves will drink up to around 100 gallons of milk a day. The milk is very high in fat content, almost 50%. And it is so thick that you can wrap, around your, wrap it around your fingers if you come across it in the water. Now we'll talk a little bit about whale behavior. Humpback whales can be very curious. And in this picture, you can see the whale has surfaced beside our boat. This was in a time when I used to do the humpback whale research project in Maui. And this, uh, this behavior is called spy hopping. And this whale followed us around in our research boat all day. She, at times she was swimming along underneath our boat for um, as we moved along the, the edge of the bay. This, they can be even more curious than that. In this instance, the whale positioned itself beside the boat over the course of a few hours. Whenever the boat drifted away, the whale would follow and, even, and it even allowed us to rub its head. We saw the same whale do the same thing for a few days in a row. Calves can be even more curious and they'll sometimes come up to researchers in the water to see what they are doing. Adult whales, and you can see the mother whale down here. Adult whales can hold their breath for around 20 to 30 minutes. While calves can only hold their breath for around five minutes, so they must come to the surface more often. If the mother is relaxed about boats and people and the calf is curious, researchers can be very lucky with having a calf continually swim up to investigate this funny looking thing in the water. The sounds you can hear in the background are me breathing through my snorkel and humpback whales singing, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. See the long pectoral fins on the calf, which is where the humpback gets its name, its scientific name, which is Megaptera, and it means big wings. So they have the largest pectoral fins of all the whale species. And if you look at an X-ray of the bone structure of a pectoral fin, it is very similar to a human arm. So you can see this water was very clear. I was really lucky to have this calf, this curious calf come up. And it was, you can see it's checking me out. We spent about an hour and a half in the water with this whale. It was so fun. Hey, in the breeding grounds, in the tropical breeding grounds, we see a lot of different behaviors as males compete for access to females, fighting to be her escort when she is ready to mate, and females work to discourage harassing males, particularly when she has a newborn calf. In the picture on the left, the whale is performing what we call an inflated head lunge, where a whale will take in a bunch of water and inflate its lower jaw, making itself look bigger to the competition. On the right hand side, we see a much more energetic behavior called a peduncle slap, where a whale can lift more than half of its body out of the water and slap it down onto the surface. In some situations, you will see a lone whale doing this and it may be letting others know of its presence because it makes a big sound and the sound travels a long way underwater. But you may also see this behavior in situations where whales are competing with each other or a female is being harassed by males. Probably the most spectacular behavior seen with whales is called breaching when a whale jumps out of the water. As with many other behaviors, we see breaching in a variety of situations. Researchers believe that it may be a response to a change in their environment, and they are using the breach to get a look at what's going on around the surface around them. When we look underwater without a mask, everything to us looks fuzzy, but humpbacks can actually change the shape of the lens in their eye. So they not only can see clearly underwater, but they can also see clearly above the surface. We don't really know why they breach, but um, 
during whale watch situations, when boats are leaving a pot of whales and they start up their engines or increase the throttle to move away, this creates a lot of noise. And in more than 50% of encounters, this can elicit a breach from whales in the area. They may simply also be doing it for fun, as we often see calves breaching over and over again. As many of you know, humpbacks can be very vocal. So let's listen to some of their singing. What you may not know is that only, whale, only males sing a song. And it's called a song because it has a structure like human song with verses and lines. And all males in the same population sing the same song. Each song is around 20 minutes long. And the whale will, will repeat it over and over again. The song is only heard while the whales are in the tropical breeding grounds. And there is no singing when they come back while they are in the polar feeding areas. So they're able to remember the song when they come back the following year. Whales don't have vocal cords, so they make these complicated sounds by squeezing air back and forth through passages in their body. They hang upside down in the water and the sound is so powerful that when you get near a singer, you can actually hear it through the hull of your boat. Or if you're lucky enough to be in the water, you can feel it vibrate the air inside your body. The sound travels for tens of miles underwater. So it's quite common if you're in the Hawaiian Islands during the, during the whale season and you just go out and you're snorkeling in the water and you put your head underwater, you can hear the whales singing. One of the most useful behaviors that humpbacks do from a research point of view is called a fluke up dive. They come to the surface a few times, take a, few, take a series of breaths, and on, and on the third one or so, they'll often dive deeper and lift their tail out of the water, showing the underside of their tail. The pigmentation patterns on the underside of the each whale's tail are unique to that individual. So much like a fingerprint. So by taking a photograph of the underside of this, this tail, we can track an individual through photographs across time and distance. And just so you can see how this works, this is a picture of a whale that I took in the, on the Great Barrier Reef in 1991 and while I was working as a park ranger. And take a note of the, uh, the small foot shape marked on the, on the left-hand part of the tail and the two dots just to the right of that, that foot shape mark. So this is another photograph I took five years later and it's the same whale. You can see those, those couple of marks on that left-hand side of the tail. These patterns stay stable for the entire life of the whale. Individual whales can also be distinguished in other ways, such as damage to their body. The whale on the left and in the middle have very distinctive scarring from being attacked probably by orcas while the whale on the right had a collision with a boat at some time in its life. Probably the most distinctive humpback whale in the world is this albino whale off the east coast of Australia called Migaloo, which is an Aboriginal name. It is a male whale that we have had singing underneath our boat during one research season in Australia. It looked like, um, when it was underneath our boat, it looked like an iceberg underneath the boat. It was very cool. So let's talk now about a bit about threats to whales. Whale watching has become a very popular activity all over the world as whale numbers, particularly humpbacks, have shown signs of recovery. Because humpbacks spend a lot of time close to coastlines and they can be very curious, they provide for great viewing and interactions. Unfortunately, also because they spend time near the coast, it makes them more susceptible to collisions with vessels 
and the whale on the right hand side has been involved in a collision with a vessel and has got a broken back. Whales are also threatened by some types of fishing gear. The ropes around this whale's tail are from fishing gear that it has towed thousands of miles. And the ropes were in the process of cutting through the whale's tail and would have eventually cut it off. When we found this whale, we followed it around all day, getting in the water with a large knife to try and cut the lines off when the whale stopped moving. But every time I got close, it would start swimming and I just couldn't get close enough. So just as it was getting toward the end of the day, we decided we had to try something drastic or just leave and go home. So as the whale was surfacing, I jumped into the water behind its tail and grabbed onto the ropes. As it was diving, I climbed up onto the tail and started cutting through the ropes as fast as I could. And just as I was finished, finishing, I looked up and saw we were about 50 feet down. So I kicked off from the tail and pulled the ropes free. So we had gotten the ropes off. And a few days later, we saw the same whale breaching off the coast of Lahaina in Maui. Probably the greatest overall threat to the future of many whale species is global warming. The effects of global warming are first being felt in the polar regions, which are where the whales feed. In recent years, there have been times when the supply of food has been reduced, and this will have an effect on the ability of humpbacks to, to store enough food for their long migration. So what can you do to help ensure whale survival for the future? Firstly, keep learning. Ask your family members or teachers to help you connect with scientists like me or get involved with programs or organizations that help whales. Clean up after yourself. Improperly disposed trash always ends up in the ocean and can get swallowed or caught around animals like whales, especially when you're at the beach. Don't let garbage end up in the ocean. Don't waste energy. Turn off and unplug electrical devices when they're not in use. And lastly, spread the word. So tell your friends and family about what you learned today. The end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was great, Stop Mike. Stop sharing. <laughs> Okay, that was great. Um, we're gonna get started with the Q&A portion of the program now. So just a reminder for those of you that are watching on the webpage, make sure to use that form to place any questions that you have. Um, we're gonna start with a couple that were submitted on the webpage there, and then we will visit our, our special guests on camera. So let's start with one that was submitted from Kira in Pennsylvania. She would like to know, why do humpback whales have lines on their stomachs? Okay, those lines are called ventral pleats. And so as I think when I, I during the presentation, I talked when I talked about feeding, those ventral pleats on the underside of their jaw, when they're feeding, that's those ventral pleats expand out to be able to accommodate all the all the food and water that the whales take into their mouth. So if you see if you ever see a picture of a whale feeding when it's sort of lying on its side, those ventral pleats look like a great big balloon on the underside of their jaw. And that's because they're able to expand to take in the volume of water. And then they use the, um, their tongue to suck the water and food down their throat and squeeze squeeze the water out through their baleen plates. So those, those ventral pleats then contract back to um, that, that normal looking jaw, that space underneath their jaw. Does that make sense? Yes, that does. That's a good question to kick it off here. Um, a we have question. a couple questions from Lauren and Brighton in Georgia. Um, this is another good question. They wanna know, is the migration pattern for whales along the East Coast usually the same? And where do they usually migrate to and from? Um, yes, it is very similar in terms of the timing. They, the ones along the, um, that move along the east coast of the US, they move up, they feed up in the Alaskan area. Um, so in the, up towards the polar region. And then when they move south, they go down to the Caribbean area where that's the equivalent of, that's where they go to, to have their calves and to mate. So the, the sort of Caribbean area um, is equivalent to on the west coast they go down to Mexico 
So they move up past the coast of California, but on the West Coast, some of those whales also go to Hawaii. So, and in some years, they might go to Hawaii, and then in another year, they might go to Mexico instead. So they do, they do change their migration, um, the areas that, that they migrate to in the tropics in particular, they do change them some to, at various, in various years. They don't always migrate to the same area. And that's one of the pieces of information that they found through the use of uh, photographing their tails, because that's how you can tell individual animals. And so you have all these researchers that work in different places all over the world. And so, and they compare photographs with other researchers. Um, they're called fluke catalogs. And that's how they've been able to tell where the whales migrate to. Very cool. Okay, let's go to our on-camera guests. Let's start with Tristan. If you're ready, go ahead, unmute your microphone and ask your first question to Mike. So I was wondering if like adult humpbacks or calves have like any natural predators besides humans. The main predators are orcas or killer whales, like the one you've got behind you, this your little stuffed animal that you showed us before. They're the main predators on, on, on humpbacks, mainly calves. Um, but you saw some, a couple of the, uh, the um, photographs that I had where they, they had uh, markings on their tails, big, big scratches all over their tails. They're all the adults, so they're always from um, orcas trying to, um, trying to bite off the ends of their tails. Um, so orcas will primarily attack the calves because they're not, they're not very big. Um, the, the, the mother will obviously try and defend them against the attacks from orcas. And sometimes they, you know, they're quite successful in being able to beat them off. And that tail is a very powerful weapon. And that's the primary weapon that um, the humpback mothers will use to defend their calf and beat, try and um, repel any orca attacks. And that tail is also why they, because they're using that as their primary weapon, that's why they end up with all that scarring across the tails because the orcas bite those tails. Um, orcas also, like here, I live in California, orcas um, will also attack gray whale calves that, they, that migrate along the coast of California as well. And um, there've been quite a number of instances of documented attacks um, particularly off the coast of Monterey. When, when you have whale watching boats out off the coast, people have seen um, attacks by orcas off the coast of California. Yeah. I bet that is a bit of a different experience than people probably signed up for when they went to that whale. Oh yes, it was that, very, that it's very distressing to see. That I would imagine, like that yeah. yeah. Okay, Isabel and Luke, if you guys are ready, you're up next, go ahead, unmute yourself. Okay, I would like to know um, how old are the humpback whale calves when they leave their moms? Oh, good question, Isabel. They are, they are with their mother for a year. So, okay, so they're born in the, they're born. So for example, we'll say, we'll use the Hawaiian population. They're, they're born in Hawaii. They swim back, they stay around Hawaii for a couple of, a couple of months. Usually, you know, they're, most of them, they're born around February, March. They leave April, May. And so all that time they're drinking like a hundred gallons of milk a day. So they're building up that blubber layer. And then they take a couple of months to swim back to Alaska. And again, feeding all the time for, with mother's milk. And then when they get back to Alaska, they, they stay with their mother. She's still feeding them milk. And, um, and she starts feeding then to try and put back some of the weight that she's lost in terms of her migration. And also it's a very, very, high cost in, in terms of her energy to be able to produce all that milk to feed her calf. So she, they'll, she, the calf will stay with her to all that time in Alaska. And then when they turn around to swim back to Hawaii the following year, then the calf is on its own. So, and it, what happens is that um, a lot of the calves and they're now called yearlings because they're a year old, they swim together in big pods uh, so that they'll travel with, with other sort of yearlings and other teenager whales, if you like. So ones that still aren't fully mature, but they're more than a year old. So they move in, a, in, a, in, a, in various groups back to Hawaii. So they learn the way back to Hawaii as well. Okay, so, that's good. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Why do 
black humpback whale tail scar white? And why do white humpback whale tail scar scars scar black? Good question, Luke. It's because the um, the pigmentation when the when um, uh, when a humpback is when the pigmentation is or the the skin is removed, that's the color of the pigmentation that's being taken away. So by biting on the tail, um, it's taking away that white. So for example, if the tail is white, it, you're taking away that pigmentation patterns and the scar that's underneath is black and vice versa. So when it's black, when the pigmentation is black, um, the pigmentation, the scarring underneath is white. And one interesting thing is that humpbacks in the Northern hemisphere are quite a different colors primarily to humpbacks in the Southern hemisphere. So humpbacks in the Northern hemisphere have a lot of gray and black on them. Whereas humpbacks in the Southern hemisphere have some black, but they have a lot of white on them. And if you think about it, I think about it this way. Humpbacks in the Southern hemisphere feed primarily in areas where they're, um, where they're swimming around ice. So like in Antarctica, so that by being, when you're looking at a humpback from underneath and it's white, it looks like, it looks a bit like an iceberg. And so when they're trying to hide from predators like orcas, it's better if you look like a, an iceberg. Whereas humpbacks in the Northern hemisphere feed up in areas in Alaska where there's no, where they're not up near ice, but they're in areas where the sky is in, in, um, in that time of year, the sky is quite often overcast and it's very gray. And so it's an advantage to look like the sky when something's looking at them from underneath. It's a technique called counter shading. And so it's basically designed to protect them, help protect them from predators. Good question. Um, those were good questions. So we'll, um, we're gonna ask a couple more that came through the chat and then we'll come back to you guys on camera here. Um, we have Pablo joining us all the way from Hong Kong that has a couple questions wow. about your experience, Mike. So he first wants to know if you've studied other whales besides humpbacks. And then he's also curious if you've ever seen a sperm whale or a blue whale before. Um, okay, so no, I haven't like, I haven't studied um, other whale species extensively like I did with humpbacks. Like I said in my um, presentation, I first got involved with humpbacks when I was working on the Great Barrier Reef as a park ranger. And when I first saw them out on the water, I was just so excited. And it was like, I got a, I was just addicted to humpbacks. To me, humpbacks are the most beautiful whales. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I ha and then I, you know, I got that job. I had a job where I worked all on humpbacks just every day of the year for, for quite a long, a lot of number of years. So I didn't have time to work with on a lot of other whales, but I, um, I did see other whales when I was out on the water. And in fact, I have seen blue whales when I was out doing research on humpbacks off the East coast of Australia, we had some blue whales swim by and that was very exciting just to see how big they were. So almost, you know, twice as big as a, twice as long as a humpback. They're not as broad as a humpback, but to see there how big they are, that's just amazing. Um, and what was the other part of the question? Have I ever seen a sperm whale? Right. Um, no, I haven't seen a sperm whale. I would really like to go and see some sperm whales. They're very cool. So. Okay, we're gonna sneak in another one um, from the chat here that's kind of along the same type of question. Um, Joseph yeah. in California, is kind of curious aside from whales if you work with other types of sea life and why whales in particular what interested you about whales um i do now that I, i'm working for world wildlife fund i would do a lot of work on um on turtles on sea turtles particularly leatherback turtles in uh and conservation in indonesia but when i worked on the great barrier reef there's a lot of areas where they um the green turtles come and loggerhead turtles come up to nest. And so we used to, I used to work, do some work with tagging turtles. And there was one place that I went to on the Great Barrier Reef. It's the largest green turtle nesting rookery in the world. So it's right up in the top of the Great Barrier Reef, a long way away from anywhere. This small island, sand island that sits out in the middle of nowhere. 
And because they're, when it, it's because it's such a large green turtle nesting rookery, so anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000 turtles a night coming up to nest on this beach, there will be a lot of tiger sharks that come there to feed on the turtles. And so apart from my job of uh, having to, of tagging turtles at nighttime, we would also paint a, a colored stripe on each, on the first hundred turtles that we would tag each night. And then we would do a dive during the day to count the ratio of painted to unpainted turtles. So you could get an idea of how many turtles there were in the water around the island. And the tiger sharks would come along to check us out. And so my job was to carry a big pole around and push the tiger sharks away if they got too curious about, about us as we were diving around. So I sort of got used to also being in the water with tiger sharks quite a bit. So yeah, it's, they're the main like other the animals. Dog, like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder I how many I used kids to out there would that. want to be the, the tiger shark bouncer um, <laughs> yeah. part of that, have that responsibility. Not sure I yeah. would, but <laughs> okay, let's go back to our groups on camera here. Tristan, if you're ready um, for your next question for Mike. Um, we were wondering if you could tell us about your career path and like how you got to work with WWF. Okay, so my career path, like I said, I, um, I grew up out in the country, out in the bush in Australia. Um, and I, I used to watch Jacques Cousteau programs on TV and I thought, wow, that's so cool. Um, and I, the only thing I ever wanted to do was be a marine biologist. So when I finished school, um, high school, I applied for a university. Then at that time, there were only two universities in Australia where you could go and do marine biology. And I was lucky enough that I got into marine biology class at, at university up in Townsville. And so the first thing I did when I went to university was I learned to scuba dive because I grew up out in the bush. And so I, you know, there was no opportunity to, to go scuba diving there. So I learned to scuba dive, finished my marine biology degree, spent all my spare time going diving. And then I was lucky enough, as I said, that I went along, they had made the Great Barrier Reef for Marine Park. I went along and said, oh, I've finished my degree. Have you got any jobs? And I'm sure everyone else in my class did the same thing. But I was lucky enough that I got selected to be part of um, a team of four, five people that um, they were doing underwater surveys of the whole of the Great Barrier Reef and I got one of those jobs. So I spent a year doing underwater surveys of the whole of the Great Barrier Reef. And then when it was finally made a marine park, they put together a team of people to be, to be rangers on the reef and I got one of those jobs as well. So I was very lucky. Um, and then I went, I was there for, on the Great Barrier Reef for 10 years, went to the other side of Australia, worked in marine parks over there. And then um, because of my interest in humpback whales, I got the, this position where I was working, doing research with a group that was based in Maui and uh, spent five years doing research where I was just in Maui for six months and then back in Australia for six months, doing the same thing, back and forward, back and forward. And then... I met my wife in Maui and uh, she decided that we wanted, we decided that we were gonna try and live in the US for a while um, to see what it was like. And so we came over here and I got a job with World Wildlife Fund because of my experience on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I got a job with World Wildlife Fund and, and now I've been here for nearly, we've been here in the US for 20 years. So long time. Um, and World Wildlife Fund is a great is a great organization to work for. I really like the people that I work with and we do a lot of WWF does a lot of really good work on the ground. So yeah, it's uh, marine biology is uh, you know it's not as uh, it's not all glamorous and stuff and, but, and it's not an, it's not necessarily an easy career path, but it's very rewarding if you can find a field, to um, get a job in something that you really enjoy doing. You know, there's a lot of marine biologists that work on animals like turtles and dolphins and porpoises and whales and everything, you know, corals, everything you can imagine. So, you know, it's, uh, it, and one of the ways it's not an easy um, field to get into, to get work, but if you um, do things like volunteer, do volunteer work, 
with uh, organizations that do work in the marine environment, then that also helps a lot, you know, when you get to, you, it helps you to get some experience and um, provide you with some sort of, makes you more attractive when you um, eventually applying for positions, so. That's great advice, Happy to Mike. Yeah, <laughs> just keep you know keep your keep your ears peeled when you get older for opportunities and and make sure to take advantage of them. Um, okay, Isabel and Luke, you guys are up. Thank you. So mine is kind of similar. What advice would you give to a young person who wants to work in conservation? Oh, um, like I said, take advantage of any volunteering opportunities that you can get. Um, you know, I, I've got friends that have worked in, uh, that have worked in uh, um, a rehabilitation um, places. So there's a place here in Marin that, that does, um, works on sea, sea lion rescues and turtle rescues and stuff. And people go and uh, volunteer. Those, those um, facilities often rely a lot on volunteers. And so by going and getting some work experience with those institutions it's a very it's you know it's a very valuable tool to have in your um as part of your resume um so that's another that's one thing become learn to dive if you can if you get the opportunity learn to dive learn to learn how to drive a boat that's also another really good skill if you want to be a field biologist i mean there are there are you know, a lot of marine biologists that spend a lot of time just working in laboratories. So if that's, you know, your primary interest, then, you know, you can volunteer in, um, in research places that do um, take volunteers. Um, there's also, I know some friends of mine that run research programs on turtles and they use a lot of volunteers to do tagging and egg counting and things like that particularly in areas like Florida and stuff where there's, you know, they have a lot of turtles that come up to nest on beaches down there. So just be aware of uh, opportunities when they present themselves or, or look out for opportunities. And, um, and even organizations like World Wildlife Fund and other conservation organizations, they have interns that, that um, they take at various times of the year. So people can come and do an internship with, or with conservation organizations and that provides them then with good experience and the organization gets to know that person. And it's not uncommon for interns to end up getting a permanent position with those organizations that they've volunteered for. Cool. Thank you. So. And my question is, why are peduncle slaps called peduncle slaps? Peduncle slaps, okay. I knew someone would ask that question. So that area of the humpback whale behind its dorsal fin and down to its tail, that area is called the caudal peduncle. So it's spelled C-A-C-A-U-D-A-L, caudal peduncle, P-E-D-U-N-C-L-E. And in fact, that caudal peduncle region is the most powerful muscle of any animal in the whole animal kingdom. Wow. It's the strongest muscle. And so you can imagine when the whale picks, its, picks that back half of its body up out of the water and smacks it down onto the surface, it makes a really loud noise underwater. And in fact, even above the surface, you can, if an animal does a, a peduncle slap and you're in a boat, you can hear that sound for, you know, one or two, two miles away. It, the sound travels so far. And then also in instances where you have um, animals competing with each other, males fighting with each other, or a female who's being harassed by males and she wants them to stop, leave her alone, she will, they will sometimes do that penuncle slap down onto the top of another animal. So, you know, it's very, it's a good way of saying, back off, don't harass, don't hassle me, you know? <laughs> so and I've seen that happen lots of times. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, we are rapidly running out of time, unfortunately. So I, if everyone's okay, I'm going to try to sneak in a super fast speed round. Um, our last round of questions, I'm going to take one <laughs> more from the chat. Tristan, Isabel, Luke, if you guys can think of a short one, because we're running out of time here. Um, so Mike, we've had a few questions come through the chat of people wanting to know 
your favorite encounter with whales, or if like you have a particular memory that sticks out. We have Levy in North Carolina that asked about one of your favorite projects, as well as Aiden in Naperville. Um, curious about this. So if you have like a quick story you can share about one of your favorite experiences. Probably, I mean, probably the most satisfying experience was was getting the ropes ropes off that whale's tail. That because when I got in the water and I could see it, the ropes were cutting into the tail, and they they would have, if we hadn't got them off, they would have cut the, all the whale's tail right off. And so riding on top of that whale as it was diving and cutting the ropes off its tail and then getting off, that was pretty, that was pretty amazing. But being in the water with calves, with curious calves, like we saw in the video, that's always so fantastic. It just, I love it. That's just the most wonderful experience. And being in the water with calves is being I've had some just some of the most wonderful experiences so yeah calves that's a great answer babies. um Tristan if you have one more now's your chance um so we were wondering like how many whales are typically in like a migration pod like like okay how many yeah so when they're when they move from the feeding ground to the breeding ground. So when they're swimming, say from Alaska to Hawaii, they they move in in big groups related to age and sex class. So the ones that leave Alaska first are <clears throat> the um, the mature the the teenagers and the um, and the juveniles, like the yearlings. They they move first, and they will they don't all swim together, but they'll swim together over a period of like a, a week or two weeks. And they'll be in pods of like three or four or five or six or whatever. And then the next group to leave are the mature males. Um, and then the last group to leave are the pregnant females because they want to spend as much time in, in the feeding ground, getting as much food in as possible. It's because when they get to the, the, um, the tropics and they're going to have a baby, when they're going to produce a calf, that's going to take a lot of energy for them to feed that calf. So they need to store as much blubber as they can. So they move in big clusters related to their age and their, and their sex, whether they're males or females. Um, but when you're, when, and, but in terms of within those groups, you can see pods of uh, anywhere from two or three or up to pods of 15 or 20, which is pretty exciting. When you see a big pod like that, that's very exciting. I've been in a boat, in research boats, doing in a pod with 20 whales and it's just, fantastic there's just whale blows everywhere and I was coming to the surface and diving and I've been in the water with pods like that too and that's that's really amazing as well that's another really exciting time that I've had in the water with big pods it's crazy <laughs> man you're making a lot of us jealous over here Mike <laughs> <laughs> okay Isabel and Luke last question um so whales are mammals Yep. But I've read that all mammals have hair. So do whales have hair? Yes. Those big knobs that they have on the top of their head, um, they have each of those, those nodules um, called tubicles, they have a hair in the, ce in the center of them. And we don't really know what the hair does, um, whether it, it's able to sense temperature or whether it's um, for telling a whale how fast it's swimming, like speed sensor, um, but they do have a hair. Yep. Thank you. And another question you said like about the albino whale, do yep. white whales have black markings where black whales would have white markings? Or is it? Or yes. So, so in the Southern hemisphere whales, like the ones that I worked with in Australia, they have um, that are generally a lot of like they're 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 um, black on the top and and white underneath, and they often have a lot of black marks on the bottom of their tail. So by taking a photograph of the underside of their tail and getting a photograph of the black marks on the under underside of their tail, that's the same as taking their fingerprint. Some whales have some whales have all white tails with no black markings at all on them. And so then the only way that the way that you use the sort of thing that you use to tell um, one whale from another is the pattern that that exists on the 
on the right on the trailing edge of the tail. It's like a little scallop shapes. And so by taking a good photograph, you can take a pit, you get a, a picture of that trailing edge of the tail. And you can also use that to help identify individuals. Um, and also in Southern hemisphere whales, that, that intersection where, the, where their dorsal, where the black part meets the white part, um, that is also pigmentation that's stable for their life. So by getting a picture of that, that's also like getting a fingerprint as well. So there's lots of different things that you can take pictures of that, that help to identify individual whales. Okay. Kate? Those were all great questions. And I wish we had more time, but unfortunately we are out of time today. So I just wanna thank everyone that joined us both off camera and on camera. We had some great, great questions come in. So we appreciate that. And Mike, huge thanks to you. I hope you had fun. I know we did, but we really appreciate you joining us and teaching us all about whales and sharing your fun stories and footage. Um, real quickly before we sign off, I just want to share with everyone um, some fun educational resources we have available for teachers and parents. If you're interested, we do have a Kahoot quiz to go along with Mike's presentation. If you're not familiar with Kahoot, it is a free quiz platform. You just go to kahoot.it and enter that unique game pin that you see on your screen. All of this information is also available on the Conservation in the Classroom website where this recording is found as well. So you can always head over there to access that information. You'll also find an origami craft and the species page within WWF's website, All About Whales. If you have more questions for Mike that we didn't get to, you can always email them to wildclassroom at wwfus.org and we will do our best to get those over to Mike and get some answers emailed back to you. And be sure to mark your calendars for our next event, everyone um, coming up on March 2nd at 1 p.m. Eastern. We will have Jeff Opperman here, who is WWF's global freshwater lead scientist to talk to us a bit about how nature helps people. So once again, thanks everyone for joining us. Tristan, happy birthday. If you guys wanna unmute your microphone so you can say bye to Mike and we'll see you next time. Hey, Thank you. Hi. So fun to meet you guys. <laughs> Happy birthday, Tristan. <laughs>